Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. Well, the very tail end of that powerful jet streak we talked about last week that was moving across the North Pacific has now moved into the United States. And what you're watching here is actually kind of the, the, the end result of the disturbance that was once Super Typhoon Hagibis. And we can see that as those powerful winds went racing through the Northwest yesterday, they've dipped into a trough and have built this powerful low pressure system that the middle part of the United States will be dealing with over the next 24 to 48 hours. Meanwhile, you can see exiting here over in the uh, eastern part of the United States what is left of um, Nestor, and it uh, brought some very heavy but meaningful rain uh, to the southeastern part of the United States. But probably your attention is being drawn to the southern side of this low pressure system, which has produced some very strong thunderstorms in the overnight hours and into the early morning hours here on Monday. So let's just take a look at the storm reports over the last 48 hours so we can see that as those stronger winds came in we had uh, over almost 40 reports of severe weather in the Snake River Valley but also you can see down here where Nestor was going through three reports of tornadoes and some additional high wind reports but getting into the day uh, in the overnight hours last night and into this morning we're looking over here on the right it was part of the south central United States getting over toward the lower Mississippi River Valley where we saw um, a lot of our severe weather last night and one of the most terrifying videos I saw earlier Early this morning, this was shared by uh, Athena Rising. I, I appreciate her allowing us all to use this video. But this talks about or shows one of the big threats that I want to talk about for the next several months. We see from October through February, a lot of our tornado activities in the southern United States, and a lot of those tornadoes are nocturnal, meaning we don't, you know, they're of course happening overnight. And the only way we see them is with lightning flashes like this. So this was north of Dallas, and uh, the storms that were going through north of Dallas. So Dallas is located uh, right here on your radar image. Uh, these storms right in through are producing well-defined circulations, that one being north, this one having a decent hook echo on the south side of it here, uh, just uh, to, again in the south side of, of Dallas. So very, very tough night in this part of the country. And just to give you some statistics as we're trying to finish out one severe weather season, uh, leading into another one, we are right now having our third most active uh, tornado year uh, over the last uh, 10 years or so with over 1,500 reports of tornadoes. Average is sitting there right about 1,400 by the time we finish December. And just to give you some uh, extra information about this, here's the average number of tornadoes uh, in October. Uh, this data set is over the last 25 years or so. And if we look over the last 30 years, this is what the average annual number of tornadoes looks like. And so Texas, of course, leads the way simply because it is the largest state in the traditional tornado alley. So I just thought I would give you some of those uh, details here as we go back over to those storms that we were watching last night and early this morning. So looking at our, our lightning map here, we can see still very active storms stretching from central Texas all the way up into Iowa. We need to be discussing here where these storms are going and look at their timing. Okay. So over the last three days, uh, we can see the heavy rainfall from Nestor, of course, coming through this area where we saw widespread uh, one to three inches of rainfall here. And then we saw the storms blowing up right here in the last 10 hours uh, or so and we can see the heavier rainfall on the windward side of our mountains coming in here into the northwest. Now to put that in perspective Nestor did bring some very heavy rainfall to a region that was very dry uh, so we know the drought situation in the southeast in parts of central Texas and getting up into the mid-Atlantic and in that corridor we're going to see I think some improvement in our drought monitor update that will be coming out later on this week uh, but overall I imagine a lot of the rainfall that came from Nestor is already soaked into the ground uh, because they were desperately needing it. We still can identify our wettest corridor here over the last month or so, uh, looking at some locations getting between 200 and 500% of normal in terms of precipitation. So it is... Uh, it's, it's important to balance out these two things, but I think what would be neat to add to this is let's just, that's the last 30 days, let's just add uh, the last week into this mix here. And so even though we had some of those locations uh, that had been very wet over the last month, we were relatively dry through a big section of the middle part of the United States, as you can see here, over the last week, with really, it was the southeast really cranking away with Nestor coming through. So a lot of harvest was getting done here in parts of the Corn Belt, although here in the north central part of the Corn Belt, not, no, no chance for a lot of widespread harvest efforts due to the heavy snowfall that we were still trying to melt off, plus the rain that is coming here in the near term. So let's get in and talk about that. Looking at uh, Monday over here from the Storm Prediction Center, our main frontal boundary pushing through 
parts of the lower Mississippi River Valley stretching up into the mid Mississippi River Valley here, bringing our greatest threat for severe weather today. And in the day tomorrow on Tuesday, we will be watching for those storms to be moving over toward the mid Atlantic and the coastal plain there in parts of the uh, Carolinas. So that's where our attention will turn tomorrow for severe weather. Watching this system unfold here, you can see that throughout the mid-morning hours, the main frontal boundary will stretch from parts of Illinois down right along the Mississippi River and then back over to south central Texas. So it'll be all along that corridor we will be watching for strong to severe thunderstorms. Meanwhile, the low pressure center is taking shape right there on the Iowa-Minnesota border. And as we progress through the afternoon and evening hours, our main frontal boundary does move over into parts of the um, Ohio River Valley, specifically into Michigan in Indiana and Ohio, then stretching through the Mid-South here, bringing in some pretty heavy rainfall down all the way to the Gulf Coast. But on the back side of this system, we are adding insult to injury with stronger winds, some lighter rainfall coming down on already very saturated ground, uh, and in addition to that, uh, still, still some snow cover in this area. And what I don't like to have to show you is that as I get through the overnight hours on Monday into Tuesday morning, we can see some wet snowflakes kind of mixing in on the back side here. Uh, so stronger winds, colder temperatures quickly diving down here. But by Tuesday around 3 to 4 in the morning, we might be able to see some snow in this area. Meanwhile, out ahead of it, you can see the main frontal boundary here pressing through parts of Ohio, getting through Tennessee, Kentucky. And then we're going to watch Tuesday uh, morning to see how the storms evolve as they get over into parts of the Carolinas. We're watching Tuesday midday for the greatest threat for some severe weather there, and then again in the evening. So that's system number one wrapping itself out over Lake Superior. You can see the light snow on the back side of it. Now, getting you much beyond this forecast, getting out, look at this. This is now Tuesday night into Wednesday morning. And while we do see a little band of lighter precipitation stretching from Montana into parts of Nebraska, Iowa, this area, we lose a lot of our model confidence much beyond that. And let me show you what I mean here. Let's put out the GFS. So you've seen this. This is the system pushing through. This is Tuesday afternoon. You can see the strong storms in this area. Now, high pressure seems to want to come in behind this and keep things cleared out, especially for the southeast. See the big high there? But we still have a piece, a trough, a piece of the trough, excuse me, sweeping around the back side of this, possibly bringing in some lighter precipitation in through this area. But I've now got you out to early Thursday morning. And this is where things get kind of interesting. You see the models agree up to about right here, okay, up to Thursday around afternoon evening hours. You can see the big ridge sitting off the coast. This is a surface high pressure system and the moisture beginning to return right in through this corridor. But it is beyond that that they diverge substantially. And let me show what I'm talking about. Through Thursday evening, I have the GFS on the left, the European model on the right. Feel free to pause it and take a closer look. But what I want to tell you is the precision precipitation amounts that you see from both models here are fairly consistent. We just have a little bit of inconsistency in, 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 in some locations. Like look down here in Louisiana and Mississippi, the European bringing in more precip than the GFS does. But outside of that, things are looking remarkably similar uh, in these two images. Okay, But if I take you from this and go over to the next few days, we'll look. On the left, I have the GFS, and on the right, I have the European model. Now, you may look at this and go, well, you know, they got pretty similar patterns, but the strength of this ridge and this ridge in the European is different than it is over in the GFS. And that affects everything after this. So, for example, once we get out here to Friday evening, we see a high pressure cell sitting in this direction here in the GFS, and it's a bit more like that in the European model. And if we get into Saturday evening, now we look and we see a low pressure system developing here in the GFS. It's a little bit farther to the north in the European model. And also look at the shape and orientation of the ridges and their differences here along the eastern part of the United States. And then even taking out to Sunday, we see that the GFS brings a really powerful low up here to the Hudson Bay, whereas the European model stalls this out a little bit and leaves a little bit lower pressure in through this corridor. Now, why show you these differences? Because this is Thursday evening through Sunday evening precipitation. 
And at that time, if you're in parts of like uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, Arkansas, northern Mississippi, the difference in the model forecasts here are alarmingly different. I mean, it's all about the, the movement of these next few systems and how we pull that Gulf moisture in. Look at the difference in the models here. So the European model is much wetter during that time period for much of the United States here. But do notice that the GFS wants to take that rainfall quickly over to the Carolinas, where the European model leaves a high pressure cell kind of in place preventing a lot of that rainfall and then look at the trajectory of the heaviest precipitation in Canada compared to the two different model runs that's all seen in the difference of the position of that next low so we don't have confidence right now really moving much beyond the next three or four days and trying to see where our precipitation patterns are going to to really be taking shape here uh, so that is my multi-model analysis to kind of get you clued in on what we're seeing here throughout this week, which means this week's going to have a lot of now casting each day to see where the precipitation is going to be. We do see that in week two, our global ensemble models, the GFS on the left, the European over here on the right, do want to keep a big pocket of the northwest United States on the drier side of things. But you can see they also are attempting to keep the midsection of the country getting down into the southeast. See the same regions in through here uh, on the wetter side of things. So we're going to see this active pattern kind of reignite uh, once we get uh, you know out into that week two pattern. Uh, because the jet stream isn't letting up. We've got something else to add to this. While the tropical Atlantic is looking very uh, you know, uneventful over the next five days, we do have a new uh, typhoon to be talking about here. Um, it's called Boaloi, I think is how you say it. Um, and we'll see it here moving just to the east of Japan. And my concern is that once this gets pulled back into the flow of the jet stream, we're going to have another situation where this is going to perturb things downstream. I want to add to all of that a couple of things. I discussed this these technical details a whole lot more in my long range updates. Well, we can see that with time here, we are forecasting much larger region across the Indian and West Pacific Ocean of these stronger easterly winds. And that is changing the Southern Oscillation Index. In fact, our daily contribution of it was positive. So you can see that that's increasing. My point here is to tell you that as we slide into November, there are a few changes in the Pacific Ocean that we need to be thinking about. And those changes are happening right in through here, where we've lost some of our major cold signal in our El Nino region, because we saw that getting cool thinking, maybe La Nina. And in this area right there, I want to be watching carefully the ocean temperature changes over the next six weeks or so, because that could largely influence the path and strength of our subtropical jet stream. So again, I update about this stuff uh, every week week on Wednesday, more technical analysis of this uh, in our long range updates. So let's get this wrapped up by talking about our temperature patterns and also talking about South America. So if we play this forward, we can see the major features we're discussing right now. Deep trough Monday into Tuesday. There is the little kicker coming on the back side of it right here through Wednesday. And you saw the narrow band of precipitation right in through this area. Now after this, we see a broader ridge building out west. You can see it there toward the end of the week, while a deeper trough is sliding here through the eastern half of the United States. But some changes are on their way, and this is the major model update from the weekend. We were watching this ridge build back into a broader trough like that. We've now seen these hints of a return briefly of a southeastern ridge. And uh, we have multi-model support in that. But whenever we see a trough doing this along the west coast of the United States, we have to be watching to see if that pattern gets stuck or if it moves. So taking it out deep into next week, this is next Wednesday night into Thursday, I see a similar pattern for middle of the week next week. And that is why the models are keen on keeping this corridor wetter than normal. And that's because with that southwest trough over the southeast ridge, we tend to pump in a lot of Gulf moisture, great upper level support, and a more active pattern. But this is into week two overall. Uh, I'm going to tell you this. I hope you got a chance to read the comment I left up here in the upper left. Our pattern right now is highly fluctuating. Uh, that temperature is going to really affect our temperature patterns moving into October, which, uh, end of October, which is very uh, very normal for this time of year. So if we just look at this over the next five days, we do see that, okay, remember the first big trough is moving through, the second one's coming through like this. So this area hanging on to a slight cool bias 
as the ridge begins to form out west, but it's not that drastic of a temperature change as we had seen. In the day 6 through 10, remember, this is where we got that pattern trying to do something a bit more like this. And during that time period, we're going to see cooler than average weather that's going to stretch through the Pacific Northwest uh, up into the North Central Plains and the Canadian Prairies. At this time, we also start to see our southeastern ridge redeveloping, and that is something we have to watch very carefully as well. Moving into the 11 to 15 day time period, we were watching again a jet stream pattern that was kind of getting locked up into a pattern like this. And that is what's keeping some of the cooler bias here in the north central part of the United States, while potentially that southeastern ridge comes back in and keeps folks warm down there. So this seems to be what the pattern looks like as we finish off the month of October and begin uh, the month of November here. Okay. So quickly to finish up with South America, on the far left, we have the uh, vegetation, health, vegetation Health Index this year compared to last year. We can see that a huge section of Brazil is looking uh, much worse than it did a year ago. Over the last two months, we're looking here at our Drought Severity Index, and we can see that uh, you know the drought has been improving in parts of Mato Grosso, especially Western Mato Grosso and Northern Mato Grosso. You can see a lot more regular rainfall events, keeping them much closer to average here. But when you get down into southern Brazil, so again, this is Mato Grosso do Sul, we're, we're coming down here into Parna and then Rio Grande do Sul. Those three states, very productive here. I want to show you what's going on in Parna, uh, where they're still dealing with some drought issues. They've had a couple of big rainfall events that have come through here, but still overall, it's a drier picture. Looking out over the next 15 days or so, we will be seeing Rio Grande do Sul, Uruguay, and parts of northern Argentina showing up on the wetter side of things. But it still seems seems that the models are hanging on to the drier bias in a big section of Brazil as we move forward in this forecast. So that was a lot to take in, but I want to give you the full perspective on the things I'm watching, not only in the U.S., but here in South America. And with that, I'll go ahead and wrap it up. Have a great week. Keep a close eye on all of our content coming out this week at my.nutrientagsolutions.com. Thank you.